I'll try to catch us up a little bit on time, and um, we're all here for more questions. I know we weren't quite able to get to everybody's questions. I'll probably mine on uh, from the Penn State University Department of Dairy and Animal Science. Well, actually, Dairy's going to take on that. Animal Science is playing on uh, contact information here and in our app as well. I was on a panel, I was chair of this panel now, on Menor Injection Incorporation. So, Mark, I was a recommendation for Menor Injection and Incorporation for Phase 6 to the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Model. This is our panel. We were spearheaded by our chair, who was Kurt Dell from the USDA ARS. He works at Penn State University's uh, ARS lab. Um, Art Allen, Dan Dostey, myself, Roy McGuire, Chris Brosh, Jeff Sweeney. We're all on team. Technical support provided by Mark, uh, Lindsey Gordon, and Don Mills of Tetratech. We've seen similar pie charts to these today. Um, these are from 2009, so don't uh, put direct faith in the numbers here. But the basic point for N, P, and sediment are that the green parts of this chart are agricultural related. So if you put yourself in the shoes of EPA or somebody in Washington who's starting to look at this, you can start to appreciate why the targets, if you will, or focus come to Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, etc. cetera, for agriculture. Agricultural chemical fertilizer for nitrogen, manure, and atmospheric deposition are all parts of the pieces of the pie. For phosphorus, chemical fertilizer and manure, and for sediment, 60%, probably has 61% spilling uh, from uh, agriculture. TMDL, based on these three items. We've heard that today. I, too, chose to put off the flow chart on my uh, <laughs> slide. <laughs> Basically, we have animals, they poop, we put it in a storage, we put it on the field, and we're worried primarily about what we put on the field. So I won't spend too much time with that flow chart. We all understand that process. We need to do uh, some real bugs, so we need to make some definitions of our animals. So our definitions were for injection, a low disturbance, incorporation that was immediate with a slot or soil coverage uh, that, was, that was happening as the manure was applied. Incorporation was a tillage with a broadcast application where we till or uh, incorporate the manure afterwards for full credit for ammonia that was 24 hours within 24 hours of uh, the application. For a reduced credit, it was one to three days after. Incorporation within three days uh, would give us a nitrogen and phosphorus runoff of credit reduction. So we both, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, were credited in that scenario. Low disturbance and high disturbance. We had to think about what is the incorporation doing for our uh, soil surface, and we defined the incorporation into low disturbance and high disturbance. We kept those consistent with NRCS uh, policies at 30% or less for low disturbance and 30% or more for high disturbance. Uh, practices, when we targeted those, uh, we addressed the surface placement of manure and other uh, nutrients sources such as biosol, so we compost as well. So we're focusing today on manure, but those other items we pull into this for the modelers. Uh, reducing benefits assigned as a percentage, similar to what Doug said. If we had a uh, manure application that was broadcast and we expected that to lose 10 pounds of nitrogen to volatilization and we injected it and we expected in that scenario for it to lose 2 pounds, we would report an 80% reduction. So that's how we reported it. We based all of our reduction numbers compared to surface application with no incorporation. Uh, the panel did not consider sediment. That was thrown back onto one of the other panels, the uh, conservation tillage panel. How many panels are there? Right now. Or were there? How many panels total? We did have nine at one time. Nine at any one time. How many total over the whole process? Let's see. Including urban, there's probably been about between 14 and 20. So. <laughs> if you guys can't put a finger on it, neither can we, right? 14 is <laughs> But it tells you, it's a pretty big process. So we involved in these two panels, Doug and I were involved, we involved a lot of experts and a lot of uh, you know, brain power there and a lot of time. We did assemble a table for sediment as we reviewed papers that might look at sediment. We put that into uh, some information and passed that on 
uh, for future panels or for other people to look at. Now, nutrient delivery. There's a lot of different things happening in the Bay watershed, right? We look at, uh, from the top of the shed down to the bottom or the furthest reaches away, we have the Allegheny Plateau, we have Ridge and Valley sections, Piedmont, coastal plains. We have a lot of topography, a lot of different soils. Um, we have different rainfall, we have different drainages, etc. So based on these wide generalizations, we need to think about what type of delivery might we have in the Bay from these areas and how would that differ and how would our reductions differ and how can we break that up? Well, that's a pretty big thing to look at. And if you look at these, uh, you know, phosphorus deliveries as an example, watershed wide versus just the state of Maryland versus Eastern Shore, you see a big difference. So for phosphorus in particular, we just broke it into <coughs> two uh, ideas, upland region or coastal plain. And we kept it that simple. It worked well when we talked with the modelers and that would fit the uh, plan that they had. We could say that this was largely a giant literature review with a giant spreadsheet that took every piece of literature, put the numbers into a, a nice column in a spreadsheet somewhere and looked at a lot of things. We looked at 73 peer-reviewed articles, uh, also including some gray literature and unpublished data. For instance, Kurt Dell had some uh, unpublished data that, that really fit in well. We also looked at uh, nitrogen availability factors from the states involved in the watershed, just to get a feel for how they viewed things differently. So one thing to uh, note is that these studies were often done in small plots and done with different types of <coughs> mechanical uh, incorporation or mechanical injection. There was plots, uh, you know, in greenhouses, plots in the field. Few of them were actually field scale plots. Few of them used uh, tractor and, uh, you know, commercial size equipment. Some of them used something as simple as a spoon to do the incorporation. So we're taking those type of studies and trying to get numbers uh, for the watershed model. Some uh, things that we need to think about. Volatilization, wide range in these studies. When we look at our chart, our Excel spreadsheet, of all of our numbers, wide range. Some of them with for, uh, for injection, ranging up to 100%, 9900% reduction. Uh, losses decrease with manure coverage. So the more we cover the manure, the more we get under the soil surface, the better our efficiency or our reduction. Total loss of soluble and particulate matter for both nitrogen and phosphorus lumped together. Hard to find studies that uh, gave us a lot of, of separation that we could come up with a number of soluble part, part versus a particulate part. Leaching, after much searching, we found it as limited and conflicting reports on leaching. Some people might say, oh, if we inject manure, we're going to break macro pores, have less leaching. Other study might say, or it will show that leaching gets in, or uh, leaching is increased with injection because it's a little closer to tile drains or, or water. So we took that out. We didn't consider that we had enough evidence to say that there was a reasonable loss reduction with leaching. And here are our tables. First tables for the upland region. And after a lot of literature, we came up with these simple numbers uh, for injection. Across here, low disturbance incorporation, high disturbance incorporation, uh, nitrogen in these columns, phosphorus here. Time to incorporation, immediate for injection, 85% reduction uh, in nitrogen volatilization. Uh, reduction in nitrogen loading, meaning runoff, was 12%. For the low disturbance and high disturbance, we broke those into time frames. First day, 24 hours, we could have a reduction of 50% and 24 to 72 hours, 34%. For um, high disturbance, 24 hours, 75% uh, and 50%. For reduction in loading, phosphorus, uh, 72 hours was 70 was 24% and high disturbance, 72 hours, so three days was uh, 12%. For our coastal plain, the only thing that changed actually was the phosphorus reduction. And that was not quite as efficient, so 22% for uh, 
reduction for phosphorus, 14% for the incorporations. So with that, uh, I may have caught us up a little bit. So what's next? We're going to uh, provide that report. It was accepted in December, and uh, the report can be improved by future panels and future phasing uh, work for the Chesapeake Bay modelers. And with that, I thank everybody, and we have questions. Yes, sir. Could you back up a couple of slides? Yes. I was curious. Here? Yeah, like on these, how much ammonia volatilization did you assume if nothing happened? Like if you didn't so, inject it or incorporate in the model, how much do they assume this, this ammonia, is, uh, ammonia volatilization occurs from like poultry litter just land applied on the surface? Those numbers would be uh, provided in nutrient management planning models, etc. But with this, if that was at 100, right, this is a reduction uh, compared to service application. So service application might be a 100 with 85% reduction. This would be a 15. Good. Yes, sir. So presumably if you're not using the ammonia, it's staying in the soil. So you're going to apply to meet like an agronomic rate for a crop, you're going to put less that absolutely. Uh, yeah, if we're applying at a nitrogen rate, we would absolutely have more uh, nitrogen available for the plant and the rate would be lower. We potentially need more land. We could, yes, we could. So there's there's a lot that goes in and that would be a nutrient management planning panel, uh, you know, uh, that would be in their, their wheelhouse. Rick? Uh, there, there's a, a fair amount of literature out there that talks in terms of especially our higher solids manure that there's a reduction in uh, runoff from those sites due to the organic matter that's been added and a reduction in erosion from those sites. Did those, did that get factored into your, your factors here? It would have if the study uh, considered that as a, uh, so say the erosion, right, as a part of the total phosphorus or total nitrogen loss from runoff. So the run, uh, runoff would be in this loading area. Am I answering your question? So, so they would have had to look at a mass balance. Oh, uh, many do. Many did and do. And we, we would take that and oftentimes we're taking the numbers they gave us and converting it into a percentage, right? We have to take the data we have kind of before and after surface application compared to, to the treatment and make some assumptions. There's a lot of studies out there that might not give us the, the uh, surface application rates and so they almost have to throw that out. They would study just the injection and say this is what came off of that and give us a hard number. So would your factors uh, account for let's say a higher solids manure like a poultry litter or a, a beef feedlot manure as having greater benefit in terms of reduced erosion from that site? Our, our factors would, if the erosion meant less loss with runoff of the nutrient. Now with the sediment, we didn't consider that that was that would be on the uh, panel for conservation tillage. Yeah, so you would so capture as far as the, the soil surface coverage with, with either the uh, crop residue or the uh, and they were, you know, base residue. That would be part of that, that aspect of that piece, so not this one. Yes? In uh, scaling up some of this data, you mentioned some of it was based on small scale trials. Um, yeah, was there any attempt to make a correction for actual practice? So I know with injection, you have to often pick them up on the corners, and so things aren't actually getting incorporated in, you know, percentages of the field, or I didn't know if there's some way that you tried to account for that. We did. And we used, um, perhaps in my rush, I didn't uh, say all this as well as I would like to. We brought the panel together because we all have a lot of experience. We know the watershed well, and we have all worked with injection and incorporation on some level. So for instance, many studies would show this number at 99% reduction of ammonia loss. Right. Uh, some studies say actually it's, it's very close to 100 or they have, have no ammonia loss after the injection. We account for that because we feel that we couldn't, we couldn't reasonably say in 
and hang our reputations on 99% or 95% loss. So we kind of back, for instance, that ammonia loss off based on that fact that we know that from the test study, right, that's very well controlled to the field and reality practices, we're going to have some, some slop, if you will, in there. So good question. Yeah, yeah I, I'd like to add on to that. And, and all of these, you know, to be accurate, you probably have a range of values. But uh, one of the things that the modelers and the Chesapeake Bay program want is one number. So they ended up, so instead of saying, uh, for instance, 10 to 50% nitrogen loss, they want one number. And we chose to be on the conservative end of the loss. And so uh, the, the problem is if you give them a range, they're going to use their own judgment to whatever works out best for them to find the numbers. So they, basically, one of the things they didn't want, they wanted to take out that uncertainty, but express that there is uncertainty in the data. Yeah, um, so the real question I have, I'm going to I'm going to ask this first one so that I don't sound stupid with the second question. Um, I, was this done just for poultry litter? No, no, this, this, was, this was for all litter. So I mean, poultry litter but would... So it's is, also for swine waste and dairy waste. Correct. So, my, so, so good, because that was my, my real question kind of got at. It's the same number, volatilization losses, et cetera, are, are you comfortable with these numbers for the various manure types considering the different physical properties of that different manure types? Based on, yeah, so what, what do we have to do? We have to pick the thing that we're most comfortable with looking at all the data that we have, which includes a lot of dairy manure and a lot of swine manure. We broke it down into you know, our big Excel spreadsheet. 80% um, of the studies are with liquid. For injection for instance <coughs> then you have the poultry studies and those are done with the uh, ARS subsurfacer a lot of uh, the Beagle Sharpley Kleinman group have looked at that Dan Pope um, so there's a lot of work there but a lot of that is done with just that that non-commercial unit right yeah so we're not quite there with litter injection incorporation would be a different thing we had solid studies solid manure studies that would look at beef and poultry and yeah. we make the best judgment we can at the table and the, the numbers are kind of simplistic but we had to use our professional judgment to kind yeah, of come up with this. A little even more simplified than that week we went through the exercise in the last three or five years ago in North Carolina because we had you know yeah, uh, USDA had their numbers and ASAE, ASAB had numbers and, and we kind of simplified it down and we said okay well you know, some of these are all in place and you really can't get more than one significant digit. So instead of like 0.52 versus 0.62, we just, or, you know, it's either 0.6 or 0.5, you know, we, we kind of did that. The interesting thing is our injection number used to be a 90, you'd assume, uh, you know, 90 percent of the ammonia stay, you, you, you know, real ammonia loss reduction was 90 percent. We recently reduced it to like 60 percent. So your numbers are actually closer to the original numbers we had before, so I think that's very fascinating. Okay. Well, felt pretty confident where we came up with those, right. but it, the, so it, it, that's, that's we can all appreciate it that there's a wide <coughs> range with any study and with anything, and, and yeah. Doug nailed it when he said that, uh, and we got to pick a number, right? We need something to put into yeah, the model. Yeah, that, that gives a good argument. To and we, you know, and if, we, to if we boil down and talk about it, we can defend these numbers. And Absolutely. I just, I, that's why I wanted to know if it was multiple. Rob, just to you know, to highlight typically these percentages because we're applying against another background in the model. So that's fluctuating up and down depending upon what your base loss is. So that way we're not putting down as X pounds for using percentage. That's typically how we represent efficiencies across the GMP. There's going to be variations from whatever you're using, the type of soil you've got. Uplands, holes, you know, right. coastal soils. So that's why you see those efficiencies mm -hmm. in that way. Any questions for uh, the other panels? We were running short on time, um, and we're, we're we're here to take uh, questions if anybody wants them. Our next step for the conference would be to, to head to the poster session, the hors d'oeuvre, so you kind of fill up over there with your meal. <laughs>